much for coming this morning to the um, launch of the review of social determinants of health um, in Europe. And um, I'm Catherine, and I'm based in London, and I'm supporting WHO with their legal communications work. Um, you all have press kits which have the press release, the fact sheets, and a copy of the report. They'll also all be available online uh, on the end of the after this briefing. Um, the format for the briefing, we have three panellists who will give um, some short comments and presentation on the review, and afterwards we'll have time for um, questions and answers, both from people here, but also um, on the webcast. Um, we, were, um, we were due to have uh, Jane Elton with the public health woman, unfortunately she had a last minute um, schedule change, but we're very pleased that Professor um, David Walker, Deputy Chief Medical Officer for England, is to join us. Um, we also have Sinami Jacobs from um, uh, Regional Director of WHO Europe. And we have um, Sir, um, Sir Michael Normott, uh, Director of the UCL Institute of Health Equity, who led this, this review. Um, so I'd like to hand over now to Professor Walker to start. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I want to say a few comments about the report from the perspective of the Department of Health uh, in England. Um, I think this report really underlines the, the stubborn and persistent nature of health inequalities uh, across the European region. We're very familiar with this in England and the UK, but this highlights that it's a problem across all 53 member states of the European region. And these inequalities have persisted and, and in many cases widened despite overall improvements in life expectancy and reductions in infant mortality in most member states over the last uh, few uh, years. And they've also been exacerbated by the very difficult economic situation that we've all had to face. Uh, and these pressures, of course, uh, continue now. And they've been felt not only by the most vulnerable members of society, but really by everybody, and have shown themselves in risks to living standards, educational opportunities, um, job prospects and job security, uh, as well as health and well-being. And that's why this, this report is, is so important. It reinforces the message that people's health is shaped by the conditions in which people are born, they grow, live, work and age, the social determinants of health, and that action must be directed to those determinants. Recognising the impact of these social determinants is the first step to developing an effective response to health inequalities. Um, this recognition creates two challenges for government. The first is facing up to the extent of the public health challenge and what this involves in engaging with new partners and players at national, regional and at local level. Second, developing a clear and purposeful response that resonates with these players and with people more widely. And these factors have shaped our thinking as we've developed our response. So what are we doing uh, in, in England? Ab above all, we are very ambitious for the health of the people of England. We want to improve health outcomes for everybody um, and reduce the rate of avoidable premature mortality and achieve national health rates which compare with the very best in Europe. That means reducing health inequalities. Unless we reduce health inequalities, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to improve national health outcomes overall. It means tackling those inequalities through the social determinants and across the life course, as advocated in this review. It also means recognising that while we need to take account of the health of everybody, it's vulnerable and disadvantaged groups that face the hardest challenges, an approach fortified by our commitment to the principles of fairness and social justice. The Healthy Lives, Healthy People uh, white paper um, set out our approach, and in developing the thrust of that approach, we had the advantage of being able to build on the findings and evidence in the 2010 Strategic Review of Health Inequalities, the, the Marmot Review. We used the principles in the review to inform and underpin the white paper. The new health system introduced in England in April will also offer opportunities to meet this challenge. For example, the transfer of public health from the NHS to uh, local government allows the development of a social determinants approach across local services. It means that local decisions are taken that reflect local need across local services. 
The new Health Inequalities Legal Duty provides a focus for action on health inequalities locally and nationally. Under the duty, the Secretary of State has to have due regard to the need to reduce uh, health inequalities between the people of England across the health service. And also measuring and monitoring progress is really important to help sustain momentum and we will monitor progress on the duties and on health outcomes including through the public health outcomes framework. This WHO Europe review is an important and timely document. It adds to the growing volume of evidence that already exists and gives it a unique appeal across the European region. It offers member states a prompt to action through its recommendations and learning about what really works. And, as a pillar of the Health 2020 WHO Europe strategy, it creates a mechanism for sharing, development and review through the interaction of member states. I hope this review will encourage member states to work across government to reduce health inequalities and improve health outcomes in the same way that the English Review on Health Inequalities has encouraged us. By taking a lead from this report, member state governments can enhance the current and future health and well-being of their people, help them fulfil their potential and improve their wider prospects, and break the cycle of inequality, disability and poverty that scars too many families and communities. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Susanna Jakob, and I am the Regional Director for Europe of WHO. And let me say that this is a great day for us. It is really a celebration for us that we can jointly launch with my two colleagues the much expected and waited for study of Professor Michael Marmot, and we are very pleased that this is taking place today. WHO commissioned this study, and we find this as a critically important study for us in the way to collect evidence for the European Health Policy Health 2020. This study was done by an extraordinary consortium of European researchers and scientists led by the UCL Institute of Health Equity under the chairmanship of Professor Sir Michael Marmot during the last three and a half years. And uh, I say that this is a great day for us and this is a celebration because this study brings us vital new knowledge in the public health. And this new knowledge will be extremely useful to address the social determinants across the European region. The study provides us with an unprecedented set of evidence-based <coughs> policy recommendations on what works in low, in middle, and also in high-income countries, which is very significant for WHO because for us, Europe is a big Europe with 53 countries, as you heard, which includes also the former Soviet Union, but also Southeast Europe, all the Nordic countries. So we are reaching out quite to the borders of China. Therefore, evidence-based policy recommendations that fit the various uh, conditions of the European countries in low, middle, and high income is extremely important. And this is what this study brings to us, how we can address the causes of the causes and the so-called upstream causes of health inequalities in the different European contexts. And what is very important about this study is that this is a how-to-do study. So it is not just a study that gives you all the evidence, because we have quite a lot of evidence, but also how to respond to this evidence. And this is absolutely vital for us and for the policymakers, because now they will know uh, how to deal with the social determinants from early childhood education to employment and also to the provision of social protection according to the needs. And this study also tells us that, yes, we can do it. If there is political commitment, we can do it. So that is a very important message that I want to bring uh, to your attention. We can do it if we have the right policies in place, because there is significant choice in the policies, and they can help us to reduce the inequities uh, across the countries. And we did a lot of work during the financial and economic crisis, and even in low income and low resource circumstances, governments do have a choice. 
And this is also clear in the study that Professor Michael Marmot has produced. Yes, governors do have a choice if they invest into the right policies. It is also very clear, and the review shows us, that even with small improvements in social rights or social spending by countries, uh, they can lead to improved health and reduced <coughs> child poverty. And the review details how investments in early childhood education and care uh, lead to healthier and more productive citizens throughout the life course. Now let me say a few words about the European scene and why I launched this study. Actually, when I was nominated for this job as WHO Regional Director for Europe four years ago, and I was still working in the EU as the, European, as the Director of the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control in Stockholm, but already preparing for my new job, I was looking at the European data. And I was looking at the health outcomes, looking at the social inequities, and I realized that, yes, Europe has made significant process, progress in many ways. Because it's a tremendous progress that in 30 years we gained five years in life expectancy. But at the same time, the European region is scarred by inequalities on a grand scale. If you just look at the data that come out from a Professor Marmot's study or from the European Public Health Report, you will realize that we have 17 years difference in life expectancy among males and 12 years difference in life expectancy in Europe among females. Uh, the chances of uh, those who are um, around the childbirth to survive the childbirth are 40 times higher in the well-developed countries and, uh, and well-doing countries of our region than, than in the eastern part of the region. And maternal and child mortality is about 40, 50 times uh, different in the, between the lowest and the, and the highest figures. And this is very much unfair and very much unacceptable, and we have to deal with this. But in order to deal with this, it is not enough to see the data. It is not enough to understand the evidence. You also need the policy recommendations on how to respond to it. Because in the past we did the diagnosis very well, but we did not have the treatment. We did not have the cure. Now we have the diagnosis and we have the treatment and the cure together, and this comes out from this study, which makes me extremely helpful, uh, uh, very, very pleased. <laughs> but at the same time, yet, let me also say that it was clear to me from the beginning that it is not enough to have evidence-based studies. It is also important to have a European strategy, a policy and a strategy, which incorporates and integrates all the recommendations from these evidence-based studies into one coherent policy framework. So parallel with launching this Michael Marmot study, we also started to develop in Europe a European policy framework for health and well-being, which we call Health 2020. And this was developed through a participatory process with the member states over three years, two and a half, three years, and it was adopted last year in full consensus by the 53 member states of Europe. And many of the recommendations that come out <clears throat> from the Michael Marmot study have already been integrated into this European policy framework. So that gives us all the opportunities and all the chances to work with the European member states for the full implementations of this. So you will ask me what are our plans with the study. Well, first of all, we pursue it in different, through different channels. Uh, uh, we work very hard for the implementation of Health 2020 in every single member state of the European region to look at their national policies and see whether it needs to be adapted to the new Health 2020, where the social determinants are integrated. But parallel to that, <coughs> we are also launching <coughs> events in Europe, like this one here, which is the main event, the kick-off event. Uh, but we are also launching events in Nordic countries, in Southeast European countries, in the eastern part of the region, where we bring together through policy dialogues the policy makers who have the significant role for the implementation of these studies to make them to understand what is going on and what are the responses they can take. Because as you very well know, if we want to implement this, we have to go beyond the health sector, we have to work with all the other sectors, and this is one of the key strategic objectives that we have built into the European health policy to introduce a so-called whole-of-government, whole-of-society approach. 
So it will be a huge work for many, many years, but I am delighted that we are all here together, and with your help, with the help of the media, we can make it happen and we can make it work, and we are all relying on your support on this, and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, first, I should give you a health warning. This room has strange acoustics, so you can whisper to your neighbour in that part of the room and be hell heard, clear as a bell, in this part. The BMA holds dinners here, and it's been great embarrassment <laughs> from time. Oh, don't talk to him, and then you can hear it. So, um, I'd like to give you a flavour of what went into the review. This shows the health divide across Europe. If you said to adapt uh, an ill an judged phrase that we're all in it together, it's not true in Europe. Uh, look at the astonishing health divide from these are life expectancy quintiles, um, these are life expectancy quintiles, so the poor health to the east of the region, the better health to the west of the region, countries like this better than the UK. And uh, for male life expectancy, as Dr. Jakob said, we have a, a whoops, we have a 17-year uh, difference from the Russian Federation to Israel and Iceland. You may wonder what Israel is doing in Europe, but if I tell you that the adjacent region is the Eastern Mediterranean region, and so you can figure it out. Um, and so this astonishing difference, and for women the gap is 12 years. If you're in one of the better off countries of the region, if you're in Sweden, for example, can you relax, say job done, we don't have to pay any attention to this. Well, no, you can't actually. This is uh, life expectancy by education in Sweden. It's been improving for those with the lowest level of education, middle level and the highest level, but it's been improving more rapidly for those with the highest education. The gap has increased by a year. A year may not sound very much, but a year is enormous. It's about a third of what you'd get from abolishing coronary heart disease as a cause of death. So the gap in Sweden has increased by a year. So, and these persisting social gradient, and by that I mean it's not just people at the bottom who have the worst health, but this is the primary level, the middle level, and the top level of education. The more education you have, the longer the life expectancy, but that advantage has been increasing over time. And in the Russian Federation, for people with university education, the expectation of life at middle age has been increasing, and for people with primary education, it's been decreasing, so the gap's been increasing. So not a single country in Europe can relax and say, job done. We've got this huge health divide across the region and within countries of the region, all of us from the very best in terms of life expectancy to those with the lowest have this problem of large social gradients in health and in many cases that social gradient is increasing in magnitude. Our recommendations were grouped into four groups, life course stages, the wider society, the macro level context, and systems, health and social systems. In life course stages, we talk about prenatal, early years, and family building, which of course impact on early life development. So the idea is investing in early childhood you get improved child development, cognitive and linguistic development, social and emotional, as well as physical development. Those children developing through the life course get better education, 
more likely to be employed, better jobs when they become parents, their children have an advantage. And one of the new things that we've emphasised in this review that I had not emphasised to anything like the same extent in previous efforts was the whole importance of intergenerational equity. What happens to the parents impacts on the children. So it's not just equity in this generation, but equity in this generation impacts on the next generation. So to give you the example of children, we talk about good quality parenting, family building, and gender equity. Mortality of children younger than five by household deprivation. Households were scored by percent of households lacking three or more essential items. And even in Europe, which the rest of the world thinks is the rich region, even in Europe, the greater the deprivation from Iceland and Luxembourg down here with very low levels as we get higher, Lithuania, Slovakia, Poland, Latvia, Bulgaria, Romania, the greater the deprivation, the greater the mortality of children under five. And that's the tip of the iceberg. It's not just mortality. But as I said a moment ago, you see a similar relationship with psychological development of children and social and emotional development of children related to poverty. Can we do anything about poverty? Well, actually, we can. This graph shows poverty levels before and after social transfers. That's in your pack. So let me... Uh, this is abstracted from the previous one. Too many figures on that one. Look at Latvia, for example. Poverty is defined as less than 60% of median income in each country. Before taxes and transfers, poverty levels in Latvia were about 35%, and in Sweden, they were about 32%. In the UK, even higher, at over 40%. After taxes and transfers, poverty levels in Latvia went from 35 to 25%. In Sweden, they went from 32 to about 12%. In other words, Sweden, as a country, has decided they are intolerant of child poverty. They're going to use the social transfer system to reduce child poverty. Do you have to be a rich country to do that? Slovenia is not a very rich country. The child poverty rates in Slovenia are even lower than in Sweden after social transfers. It's a policy choice. We in the United Kingdom have chosen to have relatively high child poverty rates. It's a policy choice. You don't have to be a rich country to reduce child poverty. You have to make a decision that you want to have low child poverty rates and use the tax and transfer system to achieve that, as Slovenia and Sweden have done, and Norway. So yes, we see this relation between child poverty and poor outcomes, but it's something that is remediable by action at the macro level. Preschool education. So one is reducing poverty, but second is services matter. Universal provision of preschool education makes a real difference. This is the increased likelihood of students who did not attend pre-primary school scoring in the bottom quarter at national reading performance distribution. So in other words, what you see is children who didn't go to preschool throughout the rest of their school career perform worse. And you see this at age 15 and 16. Investment in preschool education has a dramatic impact through the life course. And I've appealed to governments of whatever persuasion. This is our children we're talking about. 
Forget left, right, this, that, the other. This is our children we're talking about. And we have the evidence to make a difference to our children's lives through the life course. And that will impact positively on reducing health inequalities. So we say that we need to provide universal, good quality early child care, education, and of course, the importance of work. Work and employment is important. Participation in the labor market is key. People don't actually like not being able to participate in the labor market. Uh, the evidence is very clear that as unemployment rates go up, suicide rates go up. People get depressed, they kill themselves, and they kill each other. Homicide rates go up. So unemployment is very bad for health. And employment is good for health, you get an income, but the quality of employment matters avoidance of adverse hazards and positive psychosocial environment. Look at employment levels among 15 to 24 year olds in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe and the Commonwealth of Independent States of the former Soviet Union. Among 15 to 24 year olds in Bosnia and Herzegovina, more than 50%. In Spain, youth unemployment is 52%. And I've described this as a public health emergency. And it's a public health emergency because of the adverse impact on mental health of youth being unemployed. Parenthetically, you see greater crime rates and disorderly behavior uh, when unemployment rates go up. But it's also a public health emergency because young people leaving school and ending up on the social scrap heap of unemployment, not being in employment, education or training, means that we reduce the likelihood of their ever getting meaningful work through the life course. This is a crucial stage of life when it's absolutely vital to be in employment, education or training. And in the work environment, the quality of work matters. We emphasized in the report the evidence from studies on the psychosocial work environment and health, demand control, high demand and low control, effort reward imbalance, I'm sure none of you have ever experienced having high effort without being appropriately rewarded. Uh, if that's ever occurred to you, you may know how rotten it feels. Um, effort reward imbalance. The evidence is you don't just feel rotten when you don't get appropriate. And reward is not just money. Reward is self-esteem, recognition, being treated appropriately, promotion, things of that nature. And effort reward imbalance increases risk of coronary heart disease, of mental illness and of sickness absence. Injustice in the way work is organized and job insecurity. Evidence is that all of those are bad for health. And if we look at how psychosocial stress varies with occupational class from a study of health and retirement in Europe, so very low occupational class to very high, the low, in the low class, effort reward imbalance and low control at work is more common than there, than there, than there. It's a social gradient. The lower the occupational class, the more common it is to have imbalance between effort and rewards and low control at work. The wider society. By the way, this photo that forms the background. These are the indignados on the streets of Madrid. These are young people protesting, saying, what have you done to our futures? We don't have a future, and we're really angry. 
And that's what I more calmly describe as a public health emergency, that we have failed these young people. It is absolutely urgent that we pursue the social and economic policies that give these young people a future. And we talk about action across the social gradient. Let me, I said it when I was talking about Sweden. Let me say it again, that we're not dealing only with the poorest of the poor. We're not dealing only with the socially excluded. But we're dealing with the fact that health follows the social gradient. The lower the socioeconomic position, the worse the health. Social expenditure. If we look at this figure on the probability of being in poor health by education. People with primary education, greater likelihood of being in poor health than those with secondary education who have greater likelihood of being in poor health than those with tertiary education. That's the social gradient. Countries are classified by their net total social expenditure in purchasing power parity, so adjusting for purchasing power. So the more generous a country's social expenditure, the more they are here, and the narrower the social gradient in poor health. A country's social policies, in terms of social expenditure, influence the magnitude of the social gradient. The disadvantage with being low on the social hierarchy decreases the more generous is a country's social expenditure. The macro level context. We talk about action across the life course, build resilience, reduce exclusion and strengthen communities. And to re-emphasize what Dr. Jakob said, that the global financial crisis is not a reason for inaction, it gives greater urgency to the kind of actions that we are recommending. And the importance of health systems. I'm not going to talk to you today, this morning, about health systems, but universal health care, universal access to high quality health care is of course vital across the region and across all our countries. Parenthetically, for people representing the UK media, the figures from the Commonwealth Fund on access to health care show in country after country, people of low income have greater difficulty in access to health care, except in Britain. We have the most equitable access to health care of any major country. And I say as loudly and as clearly as I can, please don't do anything to damage that universal access regardless of ability to pay. So when we talk about systems, we talk about health systems, but also quality housing, safe communities, <coughs> universal health care, and safeguarding future generations, intergenerational equity. We've emphasized in the report that health is a human right. The reason for action on the social determinants of health is to acknowledge the importance of that human right to health. And we have this mantra in a way. If countries say we're too poor, we can't do any of what you recommend. We say for countries that are really poor, the low income part of the region, do something. The evidence shows a small investment in early child development, a small investment in trying to reduce child poverty, a small investment in social protection makes a difference. For countries that are already doing things, we say do more. The evidence shows, as I showed you, the greater the social expenditure, the narrower the social gradient and the better the health. Do more. And if you're Sweden or Norway or one of the Nordic countries and you're already doing a lot, do it better. There's much you can do to improve the quality of expenditure and to make sure it reaches everyone at need. Thank you.
focus on the UK and how it measures up with some of these measures. It was quite badly on the trial of poverty and mortality, but not that badly on the UK employment. So, how do you summarize the position? What is the priority? Well, I'd say in the UK, where um, if I was being the headmaster, I'd say it could do better. Um, not bad, but could do better. Uh, where we do poorly is on child poverty and the impact on child poverty. And as you'll see, uh, I'm sure you covered the recent OECD report on performance, literacy, science, maths, etc., of young people, not children. And we do very poorly internationally on that. And I would say that's related to the fact that we don't do very well on early child development. We don't look very good on that. So that really ought to be a priority. Our youth unemployment is very worrying, but it's nowhere near the Spain or Greek level. But it's very worrying. I mean, if we have 22% youth unemployment, uh, that's no grounds for complacency. The fact that we're not as bad as Greece and Spain uh, or some of the countries to the east of the region doesn't mean that we shouldn't be trying to get the level of youth unemployment down. It, it is indeed. Um, in the US, they call this the Gatsby curve. Uh, why would they call it the Gatsby curve? The, what you see is the greater the income inequality of a country, the less the social mobility. So countries with that, which had bigger income inequalities had more fixed social stratification. One clear route to having low income in adulthood is being unemployed, being youth unemployed. And that means that their kids are going to be much more likely to grow up in poverty and themselves much more likely to be low income. So again, thinking of the UK, Alan Milburn's social mobility report uh, recently emphasised this. The magnitude of income inequality in this country is too big it's being exacerbated by youth unemployment, potentially, at the lower end, and that's going to have a clear impact on the chances of the next generation. And that's really tragic. Uh, Andrew, from the Stanton Museum, and tell me about Spain. Um, what specifically could the Spanish government to address the problem of youth unemployment and avoid well, we talk about active labour market policies, uh, which include um, training, apprenticeships, uh, job creation schemes. It, they also include making sure there's adequate um, income protection for the unemployed. I'm pausing because... I'm not sure what Spain can do about this, but we are concerned that policies of austerity that have been foisted on Spain, on Portugal, on Greece, out with your control from the Troika, from people coming from outside saying you have to pursue policies of austerity, are increasing youth unemployment. So when you ask what can Spain do it can stand up to the people who are telling them to pursue policies that are damaging the interests of the Spanish population. It can stand up to the Troika. Absolutely. You notice I paused before I said that, but, but yes, go ahead. Did you want to add anything? Yes, yes, I, I'd like to comment on two issues. First, on the priorities. Of course, the priorities will differ between the countries. It depends where they are in their development. Like the eastern part of our region is doing very badly on universal health coverage. So that is a policy that we are promoting very much because if there is a high out-of-pocket payment, that leads to tremendous impoverishment of the population. So that will be one of the priorities that we are pursuing in the NIS countries. But we have to analyze in every single country where they are in their development and the priorities will depend on that. Of course, 
there will be no single candidate can implement all the recommendations at the same time, so they will have to make choices also pragmatically to see what is the policy environment and what are the recommendations that can be adapted and integrated into that. So that's one thing. The other thing I wanted to uh, quickly react on the um, uh, Troika and, uh, and the austerity measures. We have been doing quite a lot of work in WHO and recently we had a conference in Oslo to give a tool set to the ministers of health that will help them in the negotiations with the Troika. Because obviously in countries like Spain, Portugal, Greece, where we are also actively working, um, they will not be able to avoid austerity measures. But you have choices even in these settings. And it is quite important that you put your austerity measures into a long-term perspective, rather, rather than to be driven by the decisions of the Troika. So this is what we are trying to support, where we try to support the ministers. And we came up with 10 policy recommendations that we handed over to the ministers of health. It was approved recently in our regional committee, in uh, which where the, all the 53 European ministers come together in Turkey a few weeks ago. And and whenever there is a meeting, like now in Cyprus, there will be a meeting with the Troika. These are the policy recommendations that the government is using. And they always come to us to ask us what are the issues, the key issues that we should press when we have our discussions with the Troika. So, of course, we link these discussions into the, the Michael Marmot study, but also we link it to the long-term policy recommendations that we have come up with to the member states. Yeah, I mean, my impression, and you'll know much better than I from uh, visits to Ireland over time, was that people are not quite as depressed now as they were a year ago, even, or a two, certainly two years ago, where uh, it was doom and gloom everywhere, the feeling that there was no way out of this. Uh, but my impression is people are feeling a little more upbeat that they're coming through to the other side of it in Ireland. But echoing Susanna's comments, um, it's absolutely vital to make to look at the impact of policies, whether austerity or stimulus, on the social distribution. In other words, to make sure that it's not the poor and the vulnerable that are bearing the brunt of policies of austerity. It's all very well saying, yes, we've got to recover, um, but to have the poor and the vulnerable disproportionately affected by those strategies, it seems to me morally wrong, short-sighted, and probably does not make economic sense either. Because if the poor and vulnerable get poorer and more vulnerable, they stop being consumers. They can't buy anything. If you want your economy to recover, you want everybody to be participating in the economy. But if you make the poorer even poorer, then they can't participate in the economy. So I think it makes economic sense not to be pounding on those lower down. And this is why we have the good news in Ireland with the Healthy Island strategy. We were there together with Professor Michael Marmot, Healthy Island strategy which was recently launched. We were there together with Professor Marmot when the whole uh, process started, and we were amazed to see that half of the government was sitting together to discuss how they can improve health and how they can put emphasis on early childhood development in particular. And I think this is a very yeah. important, very significant development for Ireland. And the same goes also for their negotiations with the Troika, where they have managed to take a more long-term perspective than many of the other countries. And we have been actively supporting also Ireland in that. And can I say that Ireland, it seems to me, a prime example of if you look at who caused the problem and who's bearing the pain. They're very different groups. The problem was caused by rapacious bankers and people in the financial sector, and who's bearing the pain? It's everybody else. I 
I think, I mean, taking female mortality, it goes along with male mortality, although the, the two are highly correlated. The country rankings differ slightly, but in general, they don't differ very much. Um, there's some exceptions to that. Um, my own view is that if we look across our 12 recommendations in this report, that the UK doesn't do brilliantly uh, compared with some of the healthier countries of Europe. So, for example, I was talking a moment ago about child poverty and early child development. Uh, we don't look among the best. We're not on among the worst, but we're certainly not among the best. If you look at educational standards, at the PISA scores, the Program of International Student Assessment on Maths, Literacy, Science, we are bumping along near the bottom of the OECD ranking. So we don't actually have a very educated workforce. If we look at um, poverty levels, they're certainly not amongst the lowest. You saw my graph about the effect of social transfers. The UK didn't, it wasn't there with Slovenia and Norway and Sweden. It was closer to Latvia than it was. So we're not doing so well on poverty um, and so on. We look at each of our domains. Um, the UK is not doing terribly, but it's not doing as well as it might. Of course, but the way we think about obesity and smoking and other unhealthy behaviours, these are causes of ill health, but we think about the causes of the causes. So we acknowledge the fact that the UK looks just about the worst in Europe on female obesity, but then we have to ask, why is that the case? What is it that we're doing wrong? Now, the UK's pattern of healthy eating uh, does not look as good as countries that consume the Mediterranean diet, for example. Uh, why we eat so unhealthily is a much broader, more complex question. Our addiction to sugar, our addiction to fat, uh, the nature of the food supply. And we think there are things you can do to change that, but we've not done very much so far. Yeah, I just want to say um, it's um, one of the beauties of this report is it enables us to look in detail at every country across a number of indicators. And what's absolutely clear is that no country has got this completely right, that every country has got something to learn from this report, not only about where they're performing badly, but also what the evidence-based policy interventions are to, to respond to that. So, um, of course, the UK has got lessons to learn. But, I mean, there are good news stories in there as well. I mean, we talk about obesity where we're doing badly, but in smoking rates, for example, we're doing very well. Yes. Um, so for us, it's a question of where do we need to target our action and think about um, new policy directions in order to address the problems that are specific to the UK. And I, I hope that other countries across Europe will be doing the same. <coughs> Well, the first thing to say, and echoing what David Walker just said a moment ago, um, the UK, as I'm sure many of you will know, has been pretty much in the lead internationally at recognising the problem of health inequalities and studying it for a very long time. And there was a long period of time where most countries said, we don't have health inequalities. What they meant was, we don't have the data on health inequalities, so we don't have them. Once they started getting the data, then they realised they had the problem. And the UK has been doing this for well over 100 years. Uh, and so a very important part of taking action is having the evidence, continuing to monitor the problem, and uh, as 
David will know, when uh, the UK produced, the present government produced a public health white paper and said we have to put reduction of health inequalities at the centre of our public health strategy, then I was really very pleased and said, acknowledging my review, said this will not be solved through the healthcare system alone, but we have to take action on the social determinants of health. So when it comes to your question then, what about what's going on now and will it harm health? The first answer is it's too early to say because uh, it takes a while for policies to feed through into changes that will impact on health. But we did a report, my Institute of Health Equity did a report and highlighted three areas of concern, income, housing and employment. And we said adverse impacts on income, adverse impacts on housing and adverse impacts on employment have the potential to damage health and worsen health inequalities. It's all in the news since Sir John Major spoke up. Now, we produced a report a couple of years before Sir John Major spoke up, but never mind. Um, but since John Major spoke up and said people have the choice between eating and heating, we have appalling excess winter mortality in the UK because people are in cold homes. Our report highlighted the importance of fuel poverty, the Department of Energy and Climate Change, have I got the right title? Department of Energy yes, and Climate yes. Change, has now taken this on board as an initiative that they're trying to work on. But there's, that's a key aspect of housing. We said in this report, as we did previously in the Marmot Review in England, about the importance of having the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. If people's income is being damaged, they may not have the minimum necessary for a healthy life. And employment, which we've talked about a lot so far this morning. So we highlighted those three areas of concern. So I cannot say that the current situation and government policies have damaged health. I cannot say that. Too early to tell. But I flagged up three areas of income, housing and employment, where we need to pay attention. Yeah, if I could just um, add to that, um, following on from the Public Health White Paper, one of the things that the, one of the actions the government took was to introduce the, uh, the Health and Social Care Act. And as part of that, they've set some of the conditions which I think are needed in order to address some of the uh, inequalities in health, particularly the establishment of a, a legal duty uh, for the Secretary of State to um, have regard to health uh, inequalities and to actually report on progress um, of the NHS in addressing health inequalities through their annual performance report and duties to, in other NHS bodies to address health inequalities. And added to that, moving public health into local authorities empowers people locally to address decisions which go across government, across agencies, um, beyond the remit of, of the NHS to bring together resources to address local needs and to address local problems. So, um, again, far too early to say if that's, that's worked or not, um, but at least it's setting conditions in place which enable some of these problems to be tackled. Well, uh, picking up what Dr. Jakob said, um, we don't simply say, well, here's the report and we sit back and wait to see if anybody reads it. We'd like to take more positive action than that and bring it to people's attention. And what we want to bring to people's attention is two things. One, it's got some very practical recommendations. And secondly, we can point to examples of good practice. I don't want to single out Slovenia, but when I was talking about child poverty, I said, here's a country, if you look, if you put all the countries of the European region on an income graph of person, you know, purchasing power parities, Slovenia's just coming out of the poor group, almost entering the richer group. So it's somewhere in the middle. 
And we can do that for many of the things we're talking about. We can point to countries where they are taking action. So we can actually go to a country and say, look, this is really possible. There are really things you can do. We're not just going saying, here's a menu, go away and do it, and then they say, we're too poor, we can't do anything. Rather, we say, here are countries that are relatively poor or relatively rich or somewhere in the middle that are taking practical, concrete action. They're really doing things that are likely to make a difference. So, in other words, we're trying to influence the agenda, not simply take no for an answer. Sorry, third point. Uh, are you worried that things will deteriorate um, quickly? Well, I've, I'm always worried. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm always worried. Uh, but my general view is that people outside the European region are right when they say Europe is a rich region of the world because we have enough money in the European region to do the things we want to do. The question is what priority are we going to give to them? We will take this forward proactively and we already have a plan for this and on a country by country and also sub-regional basis. And we take it forward also as part of the health policy, as I said earlier, but also together with some of the other evidence-based studies. And if you look at your PEG, there is one more important one that I would like to flag up, and this is the economics of prevention. Why we have to invest more into prevention and into public health, and what is the benefit to societies that this will bring? And this is an OECD WHO observatory joint study that we will also launch in the coming uh, years. Because in the last 10 years, we have not invested enough into public health, into prevention and health promotion. And this also brings us back to your question. And that is an area that we have to scale up in our activities. And the social determinant study and uh, the public health investment, which is also so socially determined in many ways, so the two are very closely interlinked, they will have to go ahead hand in hand. Well, what we see across Europe, if you look at the unemployment rate of a country, it correlates with the suicide rate of the country. And a, crudely speaking, a 3% rise in unemployment is associated with a 3% rise in suicide if a government does nothing. The greater the expenditure on social protection, the smaller the rise in suicide associated with a rise in unemployment. So, for example, countries of the east of the region which spend $50 or thereabouts per head on social protection, a 3% rise in unemployment is associated with about a 2% rise in suicide. In countries to the west and north of the region that spend $150 or more per head on social protection, a 3% rise in unemployment is associated with a less than 1% rise in suicide. So now suicide is the tip of the iceberg. It means there are other big mental health problems. So the first is for young people, there's profound impact on mental health. But what happens over time and we see this from the unemployment, uh, big rise in the unemployment in the 1980s in Britain. And my colleague Peter Goldblatt uh, was involved in studies showing that for each social class, the unemployed have a 20% higher mortality than the employed. So accounting for where you are in the social hierarchy, being unemployed over time that's not an acute effect, but it's following people over time. Unemployment is associated with increased mortality. So there's a longer-term impact on physical health as well as the short-term impact on mental health. And related to that is the issue to which I alluded, which is that 
The worry is that youth unemployment becomes older adult unemployment or older adult marginality and poverty. And so it has impacts not only on their career through life, but on the next generation. So then they have children born into poverty and it has adverse social, developmental and health impacts on those children. A lot of these tables in the, uh, in the full book that seem as if they are sort of selected countries rather than the whole, the whole, uh, the whole list or something. Um, I just wondered if you could briefly outline for the UK in absolute terms where we rank in Europe on female life expectancy, mortality, young children, child poverty, obesity. Well, for. Um, for female life expectancy, we're clearly in the top group, but not at the top. There are others above us. France, Spain, Sweden, there are others above us. So we're, we're not like Kyrgyzstan and Russia, but we're not like France either. So we're near the top, but as I said to your colleague's earlier question, um, doing well but could do better. For obesity, we're dreadful, absolutely dreadful, and particularly female obesity. And we see a very clear social gradient in female obesity. The lower the status, the greater the obesity levels. And, and that's colossal, dramatic, and appalling that we have such high levels of obesity. We really are storing up big problems there, so we're doing very badly. On child mortality, we're happily in a group of countries that have very low child mortality rates. We're not the best, but um, we've had such dramatic reductions in child mortality over the last century that it almost, you can't see it compared with what it was 50 years ago even. So we've had dramatic improvements in child mortality. We, you know, it shows, and I find this very encouraging because it shows that you improve social conditions and major health indicators get better. So the child mortality in this country, we worry that there's still a social gradient in child mortality, but it's at such a low level compared with how it was. So it shows what social action can do and uh, really to make things better. But the other indicator, the one I referred to previously, if we look at the OECD figures on inequalities of indicators of child well-being, which include material well-being, health, and various measures of child development, then I think it's out of 20 countries OECD countries, we rank 16th. There are 15 above us. That's not very good. Sorry, just to follow up with the obesity, are we, are we actually the worst in Europe or is there a country below us? In the table in the book, we're at the bottom, but it's only selected the country. Well, I'm not sure we have it from every country, um, but I think we're the worst of the countries that we have it for. Obesity. Obesity. We're the worst, but that doesn't mean we are the worst, we just don't have data from every country. Well, I, I wouldn't use the word hiding. <laughs> I mean, well, the reason we have um, universal access to a quality system is precisely to treat problems when they occur. So uh, I wouldn't call that hiding the problems. It's dealing with the problems. Now, my own view, and people have expressed this in a whole variety of ways, is that the majority of the determinants of health 
lie outside what the healthcare system does. What we want a healthcare system to do is be there when people get sick. It's not a lack. It's not lack of health care that determines the onset of sickness in the first place. But we want a high quality, universal access health care system to be there. So you don't add the the insult of lack of health care to the injury of getting sick in the first place. So our health care system is absolutely vital. And I've had to say this very often. People say to me, are, are you saying that if we invest in social determinants, we won't need a health care system? Of course not. Of course not. Not for a moment. People will still get sick and they'll need high quality health care. To answer your second question, what are my fears? My fear is that unless we keep this uppermost on our agenda, what we've achieved, which is universal access and equity of access, regardless of income or ability to pay, could be damaged. And that would be my fear, that we damage that dramatic, welcome societal achievement of having a universal healthcare system available to all. And we must make sure that we don't do anything to damage that. So I don't know if that's a fear, that's a caution. Well, I, I've talked to colleagues right here at BMA about that and they say, so far we have no data. I mean, I've asked them that question. I say, you, the guys who are studying this, what are you seeing? And they said, so far, we have no data. So I can't answer that question. But that's what we are all concerned about, that we don't damage that universal access. Okay, we need to, to finish that. Thank you very much for coming. We've got a, a quick window for any follow-up questions. Thank you.